Psalm 23, again, if you're visiting, welcome. So glad you're here, here at Calvary Chapel. We study the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We are currently in 2 Peter. We're actually going to finish it here in the next couple weeks. After that, we'll be going to the book of 1 John prayerfully, unless the Lord decides to lead somewhere else. But that is the plan. That's what I have on my schedule. But today, something else that we like to do here at Calvary Chapel is to be led by the Lord. And um, today we're going to deviate from 2 Peter, and, and we're going to look at Psalm 23 and maybe some other places in Scripture as well, and uh, I'll explain why in just a moment. But if you will, I'd love to pray really fast and uh, before we get started, and then we will, we will go from there. So Father, we thank you so much for this day. And God, we just praise you for your goodness. Lord, your goodness that we've sung about this morning, Lord, about how you are Lord, so faithful. You are a shepherd, just as we are about to read, who leads us and who is faithful. God, you are the way maker, the miracle worker, promise keeper. You are the light in the darkness. God, that is who you are. And Lord, we just praise you. All of those things that we sing are true. And all of what we see within your word, Lord, we know that that is true as well. And I thank you so much, God, for the opportunity that we have today as your church to, to read your word. And if all we did was come here and read your word, even just one verse of your word, God, that would be enough for your church to be edified because we know that, God, your word is for us. It is profitable. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that it's, that it's true. It will always be true. And it equips us and it leads us in this world. And God, at times, it as well rewrites our focus and it encourages us, Lord. And I thank you so much for that. And today, as we look at your word, God, I ask that you would speak to us, that you would lead us today as we talk about the truths within your word, and we seek to apply them, even here and now, God, that as we seek to apply them, that, Lord, you would help us with that. And Father, I just praise you for your goodness. I praise you for these that are here, and I just ask you, God, that you would lead us now in this, in this time. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, something you may not know um, is on Sunday mornings, uh, and this is not a big deal that you need to know this, but just to kind of tell you how my morning went. Uh, I get here about 6.30 on Sunday mornings, and I go into my office, and I, I get things going. I get the study guide together, get my slides put together and stuff like that, and, and it's a good time for me just to sit alone with the Lord, drink some coffee a, a little bit longer, my third or fourth cup of coffee to get me ready for today or whatever, and um, as I'm sitting there, I have opportunity to pray, and what I love, too, is I have opportunity to hear the, the worship team come out and start practicing. They get here about 7, 7.10, and start practicing shortly after that, and it's a great time for me because as I'm sitting in there and, I, and I, I'm, I'm looking over my notes, I'm getting things put together for the morning, getting in the right frame of mind, continuing to pray, I get to worship in my office. It's just on the other side of that wall over there, and I just get to worship. I get to praise the Lord. And, you know, this morning, as I'm sitting there and I have my, my iPad open with my study for today, again, we're in Second Peter chapter 3 is where we're going to be today, verses 1 through 9, looking at scoffers, not false teachers, but scoffers coming against the church, seeking to distract and discourage the church, something we can't expect to happen in our day as it did in Peter's day and what we're going to study extensively next week as the Lord would lead. We're, we're, well, that was the plan today. And something I like to do, something I, I do for Sundays and Wednesdays is whenever I, I open up my iPad and I get ready to start honing in on the study and getting ready is I say, Lord, what do you have today? Because this is, as I've said before, and I will say always, this is the Lord's church. It's not mine. I, I'm the senior pastor of this church, but I'm just an under shepherd. I, I, Jesus is the senior pastor. He is the true chief shepherd of the church. And so I get the opportunity to, to just under shepherd, under the greatest shepherd in the world, in the universe, quite honestly. And, and as I ask and seek the Lord, you know, normally as you come, if you call this church your home, you, you, you experience what, what I experience. The Lord's like, yeah, teach what I put in front of you. And I'm like, all right, praise the Lord. Here we go. But sometimes, sometimes the Lord, because we have a God who is alive, who is not far off, who is not uninvolved, nor is he apathetic, but who is very involved in our lives, sometimes the Lord speaks and says, hey, let's change things up a bit. Let's do something different. Let's do something different. And, and, and it, it, it is always, because the Lord is always faithful and the Lord is always right, it is always in line with what the church needs. And I know that our God is good. And he knows what the church needs. And he knows what each local church body needs. That's what I love about the Lord. Is he's the Lord over all of the global church, but he's also the Lord over the local church. This local body, us as the church here in Paris, Texas, the Lord is intimately involved with our lives and desires to lead us and walk us through things. And if you call Calvary Chapel Paris your home, you know, and if you don't know, well, let me educate you on this, and I would love to be able to help you to be more in the know if you would like to, so you can pray and so you can be involved. We as a local church body, over the past, really, bulk of this, of this year, and really over the past few months, 
We as a church body have experienced great hurt and great loss. We have experienced great hurt and great loss by way of sickness, by way of death, by way of just life situations. And, and when we talk about like, like death, there's been a lot of death and a lot of hurt and a lot of things, someone put it so well after first service, a, a lot of things that have just like stopped life. Like, like, like death and, and, and tragedy within our church body that has just like come in and invaded life and just made life radically different for various people very quickly. And death is one of those things. Sicknesses are another thing. And that's, that's, that's a product of, of being a human, living in this world that we live in. We live in a world that has fallen. When it's fallen because of sin, sin that came into this world. In Genesis chapter 3, we're told about the fall of man as sin entered the world. And along with sin, well, that came death. Because James 1, 1.15 says that sin, when it's full grown, it brings forth death. That's spiritual death. That's physical death. We live in a world where death is something that we experience. Spiritual, physical, and hurt is another thing because everything is decaying. Everything is breaking. And as a church body, as we experience these things over and over and over again, well, what it does is it tends to permeate and starts to cause hurts throughout. And that's because we are a body. Jesus you know, Jesus, as he, as, he, as, as he died for us, he gave himself for us. And as we are reconciled to him, as we are saved, we become the body of Christ. We are seen as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Peter calls us a spiritual house. And, and all of these things work together. You know, a body works together. If your arm hurts, the whole body hurts. If your teeth or your feet hurt, everything hurts. That's just the reality. And the same for us as the body of Christ. When one hurts, well, we all hurt. When there is suffering within the body, it is easy to see that suffering permeate. And what we need to do as the church is recognize that that is the case. And that, that is true. And none of us would deny that. None of us would deny that in this world we have hurt. In this world we have pain. In this world we experience things that we don't want to experience. However, again, because of this world being fallen, we do. And what we as the church have the opportunity to do is in those moments, do a couple things. One, we can, we can callous over and withdraw, which is natural for humans. That's what we do. Or what we can do is we can press in and see that the Lord, as David is about to share, the Lord is still, and this is hard to hear at times, but this is always true, that the Lord is still good and the Lord is still our shepherd who wants to lead us and help us and guide us through the hurt. And church, as we are here together today, knowing that there's hurt within our body, knowing that there is pain even within this room, it does us well to remind ourselves of that. I believe the Lord wants to remind us of that today. And so if you have your Bible, what I want to do is read Psalm 23 in its entirety. And I want to pray one more time because I always like to pray after we finish reading God's word so that he continues to lead the time. And then I want to talk about that for just a bit and see how we as the church can respond to that. So if you have your Bible, Psalm 23, verse 1, I believe the verses will be on the screen as well if you don't have a Bible. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup, it runs over. And surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this true word, and I thank you, God, for your goodness in giving us your word. I ask that, God, as we spend some time in it, that you would just speak to us, and I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we all know this psalm. I mean, even if this is maybe your first time ever coming into a church, you, you have heard this, this psalm, especially because you grew up or, or you're, you're in, you know, Northeast Texas conservative country. I mean, this psalm is on a coffee cup or a poster somewhere within your proximity. And, and we know this psalm and know various parts of it, but what we need to know as the church and be reminded of, again, Peter, as we've been studying, we know he's all about reminders. What we need to be reminded of is the legitimacy of this psalm. As simple as it may be, the legitimacy of it is amazingly true because it is God's word. And David, is, as he is living his life, and if you've read David's story throughout the Old Testament, you know that his life was crazy. Like he, he was a shepherd boy, so he, he writes this experientially. 
He was a shepherd boy before he was a king. In fact, you'll remember when Samuel comes to anoint the new king of Israel, his dad, Jesse, is like, hey, here's my tall sons, the handsome ones. These are kings. And Samuel's like, no, it's not them. Do you have anybody else? He's like, oh yeah, I've got this one other small, ruddy, good looking kid that's out in the field somewhere. Let's call him in there. And he anoints him and David is going to be the new king of Israel. But if you read his story, you know that David's life, before he was ever crowned king officially by man, God had anointed him, God saw him as the king, but he had a hard go at his life. He had a hard go being pursued by the current king Saul, being run ragged as he fled for his life. On many occasions, we see David, he, he, he has a hard time. And then after he is a king, well, it becomes even harder at times as his own sin has consequences, the sin of others has consequences, as it always does, and death is produced, hardness is produced. And what we see from David is a continual need to cry out to the Lord, a continual need to be led by the Lord and be shepherded by the Lord. And this is a great example of it here in Psalm 23. Again, as he says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. What he does is he establishes that as a fact. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's choosing here to believe in the true fact that the Lord is his shepherd. And as such, he shall not want. And this is in a dire time of David's life as he's fleeing to and fro from Saul. And he writes here, knowing of the dangers that await him at every corner. He says, you know what? I know what's going on, but yet the Lord, he is my shepherd. So I shall not want. He establishes a fact. And then in verse two, he establishes another fact. He says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. This is this truth that we see within following the Lord, that the Lord, as as he leads, he's going to lead to exactly where the sheep need, to the green pastures, to the still waters. Again, what would be experiential knowledge for David? He knew that green pastures, well, the sheep needed to eat well. And that still waters, as the sheep needed to drink, they didn't like running water, so they needed a deep pool so as to be able to drink the water. He establishes these two facts. He then says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Notice what he's doing is he's saying all of these things that the Lord does, and he does, and he does so in a factual manner saying, he is my shepherd, he leads me, he restores, he leads me in paths of righteousness, all for his name's sake. David here speaks of these things again in a time of life where suffering was what he experienced daily, when running to and fro and from danger was real, which makes verse four so impactful as he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He says there that, yeah, I'm going to walk through it. And he, he, he acknowledges a truth of our life, a truth of the Christian life even today is that as you walk in this world, the Lord doesn't promise ease. The Lord doesn't promise comforts. The Lord promises his presence though. The Lord promises his presence. And David says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's like, I, I won't fear any evil. And this is the first time here that David, as he speaks this out, he's been laying down facts of who the Lord is as a shepherd. And this is the first time within the Psalm that he says, so I'm going to do this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil because the Lord factually is his shepherd. And then he goes back to the Lord being the shepherd, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He knew who he was with. And he continues on that same vein of thought. The idea of peril, the idea of danger, what David was very familiar with. He says there, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. He knew the truth. David knew the truth that as he followed the Lord, there were going to be these enemies around him. And yet what he did is he rested on the fact that God, well, he was stronger. So as he could sit in the presence of the Lord, as if he was sitting at a table, sitting in the presence of his enemies, he had his head anointed with oil. His cup runs over this idea of abundance, this idea of ease and relaxation, of knowing who his shepherd was. And he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I love that verse because that surely, well, he's again establishing this fact. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And that that follow, the the translation, I I, I like another word for it. It's this word pursue because that follow is like this active pursuit pursuing, this active following the Lord, the goodness and mercy of the Lord will pursue me all the days of my life. It is coming after me. And he says here, establishing another choice, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, David, what he does is he lays down from experiential knowledge of following the Lord and also of being a shepherd himself, knowing what it looked like 
to establish the fact that the Lord was his shepherd. That the Lord was his shepherd, seeking to shepherd and to guide his life, to provide for David, even within the peril, to restore him, to lead him, to raise him up, to feed him, to help him in all of these different things. And we see that as he shares these things, these facts of who the Lord is, that he shares them. And then at the end of it, he says, so surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell, saying that I will choose to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, David wrote this psalm in times of great suffering and great peril. And we know this psalm very easily. And it's a great psalm. I love this psalm. I used to say this over Oliver as he was really little to a point where when he was three, he, he could recite it. Not because he's some super godly little you know, three-year-old, but just because it was consistent. He knew it as we know it. But what we as the church can do and what we as the church need to do so much often than we do is recognize the truth of this simple psalm. Recognize the truth of this simple psalm. And, and sometimes... There's certain events in our life, there's certain events within our life and within this world where this psalm, we need to remember the legitimacy of it just a bit more. And again, as a church, as a local church body who, again, has experienced great pain and great suffering and seen great suffering within families and within lives individually and corporately with sickness and with death and things like that, it is such a good thing for us as the church individually and corporately to remember that the Lord is our shepherd that the Lord is our shepherd and I shall not want. And he makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All of these things the Lord is and the Lord does, he does for us and he does for us as a fact. And he does for us because he loves us and he wants to lead us. In the same way that David was a shepherd that loved his sheep. We to we're told in the story of David and Goliath that as the bear and the lion would come after the sheep, he didn't run away like the hireling does that Jesus talked about in John 10. What did he do? He faced the lion. He faced the bear and he took them out so as to protect the sheep. And the same was with the Lord. David knew that the Lord was a shepherd who was right on. And my friends, the same thing is true for us that the Lord is our shepherd and he is always going to be a good shepherd. He's going to lead in the same way, again, that Jesus said in John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. He compares himself, you'll remember, as we studied this just a couple of weeks ago, he compares himself as that good shepherd to the hireling. The good shepherd is the one that gives his life for the sheep, the one that protects the sheep, that feeds the sheep, that tends the sheep. That's what Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 5, which we studied, again, a few weeks ago. The reality is that we have a shepherd that loves us and that guides us and that works with us and seeks to feed and encourage and help and comfort us as we face the things that we do. And what we as the church need to do, friends, is let this familiar psalm not just become so familiar, but let it continue to be powerful for us. And let it be powerful for us as a church who has experienced in these past few months, in this year really, great loss and suffering. And to not have this in our minds so that all of a sudden we're good, right? Because let's be very real, that is not going to happen. In this world, we, we, we have hurt. In this world, we have sin that, that causes hurt and decay and death and all of these different things. And so there's no looking at this and saying, okay, I'm just going to believe Psalm 23 and all of a sudden everything's just going to be amazing. Because let's be real, that's not going to happen. Because hurt is real and hurting people are real. And getting involved with hurting people, as we as the church are called to do, as we support and bear with one another, that gets real. And that gets real messy really quickly, which is why so many of us as humans, we seek to draw away when hurt happens. We seek to draw away when hurt happens because hurt people are, are messy. Hurt people are hard. But we as a church, what we get to do is we get to say here today that we see our Lord as our shepherd who is leading us even, as a season, even in a season where we see loss within the church, within the local church and hard within the church, even hurt that we don't know about, hurt that is represented in this room that maybe you haven't shared, that you're holding inside, that you know the Lord knows, but perhaps you're still walking alone in. And though that is your business, though that is your prerogative, Understand that as the church, what we are called to do is to bear with one another and support one another. And don't feel if you are hurting today that you need to suffer alone, that you need to sit alone and suffer. Nor do we as the church need to be those that turn an eye away from the hurt. Again, hurt people are hard, and so it's very easy to do. But what we need to remember is that the Lord is our shepherd who wants to lead us. 
And as the shepherd leads, he doesn't just lead one. No, he leads an entire flock. He leads all of us. And I speak to myself as much as I speak to you guys today. That as we as the church experience and see this hurt and see this loss, what we need to do is collectively remember who our God is. Remember who the shepherd is. And then as the body of Christ being led by our perfect shepherd, seek to pray and seek to encourage those as we have the opportunity to do, as they are brought to our attention. Well, let's be those that are sensitive to it and are praying for and pouring into as we have an opportunity. And again, it's sometimes where we get to points like this and places like this where the hurt becomes very heavy. And I'm going to be very real with you. Today, as I'm sitting in my office getting ready to teach 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 9, the hurt became very heavy. Because even in recent days, we've had hurt experienced within this church body. We've had deaths that have occurred even within the yet yeah, this past couple of days. And as such, we as a church, we have an opportunity to remember today that the Lord is our shepherd. And so though it's not going to be easy, we shall not want. And he makes us to lie down in the green patch. He leads us, he restores us, he leads us. And though we walk through the hard, the Lord is with us. And the other thing that it does is it gives us an opportunity as a church, not just to remember who our shepherd is, but again, to be ones as the church who God wants to include to be a part of seeing healing take place and seeing the Lord use us so as to stand in the gap for those that are hurting, to be able to pray for those that are hurting, and to be able to do so, not, not, not at a time that we set later on, but as we have opportunities as the church, and as the church should do, to do so in the here and now. And I know that you came here today so as to sit for, you know, about 40 minutes, and to be engaged, to take notes about 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 9. But today what we're going to do is something a bit different as we are brought to the attention of our God being our great shepherd who we get to look to, the shepherd that leads us, but also as Jesus saves us, wants to include us in his mission. Well, we today have an opportunity to be able to think on those within our body, within our lives, even outside of this body, and be those as the church who bear with them. Be with those that we know and bear with them and know that our God, he, he knows them. He knows their frame. He knows their situation. He knows every single detail. And what we get to do is we get to pray and ask for the Lord to move in their life and to work in their life and understand that the Lord, he hears us and he wants to lead us and he wants to lead them. And as we pray, what's so amazing is we get in line with that working. You know, as we pray, what we do is we get in line with the will of God. His will becomes our will. We think on the things of him. And as we do so, we get to pray with, for those that we know. We pray with specificity for those that we care for, those that are hurting and ask for the Lord, hey, be in their life, work in their life. How can I work in their life? So many things that we have an opportunity to do, an opportunity that we as the church, because this is what the church should do and is about, we as the church have the opportunity to pray. We as a church have an opportunity to be the church and to bear with those that we know that are suffering. And so church today, I'm going to do two things. We're going to do two things as the church. The first one is going to be individual. Individual, but, it's, but collective. I know it's paradoxical, but roll with it. Whereas each of us in here represented as individuals have different spheres of influence, different spheres and places and spaces that we occupy, different things that we know, different people that we know. Well, there's different hurts that we know about. There's different things going on in different people's lives that you know about that I may not know about. There's different things going on in your world that I may not know about. There's things going on in my world that you may not know about. There's things going on in this world represented by the myriad of us in here that we can take to the Father. And as we do so, we can know that the Lord hears us. And that's so amazing about our God, right? Like the Lord, he, he's, he's the, he is the Lord over all the earth, and he is the Lord over the entire church. The church is, is the bride of Christ, and as such, he is intimately involved with the whole church, but also, too, with the local church. And so what's so amazing is we as people here in this building right now pray and seek to stand in the gap and pray for peace and for comfort and for healing and for the different things. The Lord, he hears us, and the Lord, he also is working as we pray. That's such an amazing thing about our God. And so what we have an opportunity to do and what I want to ask of you today, Calvary Chapel, to do is to take time in just a moment as we take time together to think about those in your life. They may go to church here. They may not. 
to think about those in your life. They, they, you may know them. You may, you may know them from work. You may know them from school. You may know, well, I don't know. And we may be praying for the same people. But we're going to take a moment here in just a moment, and we're going to pray. And we're just going to pray together but separately. Where you, as you think on those people, you think on those, per, those persons, that person, I want you to where you're at, just call out to the Lord for them. And pray for them. Pray that the Lord would bring them peace in their hurt. Pray that the Lord would bring them peace in their discomfort. Pray that the Lord would bring them healing in their sickness. Whatever it may be, know that we have the opportunity today and should take the opportunity to pray to our good shepherd and ask that he would lead and ask that he would lead and show us how we can be led by him to see healing, to see comfort be brought to those that are hurting. Psalm 34, much in line with Psalm 23 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And they looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man, he cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around, all around those who fear him and delivers them. He says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions, they lack and suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. He says, Come, you children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. It says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. In verse 17, it says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as a contrite spirit. And many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of, all, out of them all. He guards all of his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Psalm 23, Psalm 34, so much of the Word of God, all of the Word of God. It points to the fact that we have a shepherd, a God in, in heaven who loves us and desires to lead us. And in this world, as the church, as humans, we're going to experience hard, we're going to experience tragedy. And again, as a church body, this is something we're walking through right now. Again, if you're visiting, if you're new, this past year, this past summer has been very rough for many in this body. And what we know is that though the hurt is real, our God is still good and our God is still faithful and will still continue to lead. And so we as the church today, we acknowledge that that is real. And I pray that we wouldn't ignore that. We wouldn't negate that. And all the more as the church, what we would do is seek to look to our shepherd and see how he wants to lead us, how we can follow him and how we can partner with him as he wants to include us to pray and to encourage and to continue to see the Lord work even amongst the heart how we can see him be faithful and continue to be faithful because he is faithful and will always be so. And so today is out of the ordinary, yes, but it's a good reminder for us as the church to know that we have a shepherd who loves us, who is leading us and who we get to partner with so as to remember his goodness, see how he wants to lead us and as well to comfort those around us who are hurting. And this is something too for us as the church. Again, if you're hurting, don't hurt alone. Don't suffer alone. Ask for prayer. Seek that out. That's why we have the prayer chain. That's why we gather together on Sundays, not just for the building up and the edifying of the body through the teaching of the Word of God, though that is so important, and we will continue to do that until Jesus takes His church home. But we are here as well to be fed the Word of God and then to act upon it, to act upon it and to pray and to be involved in each, each other's lives as we do so. And so as the Lord would use you, be used by Him. As He would lead you, be led by Him and allow him to use you and see how you can comfort those that are around you as our chief shepherd, as he comforts us and leads us as well. And so I'm going to pray one more time, friends. And that'll be the end for our time today. Again, next week, we'll be back in Second Peter.
Tony's going to come out and lead us together in another song as we sing about God's faithfulness and His love that never ends. And then we'll go our way into this mission field of the world. But I want to thank you for being here today and thank you for doing what the church is supposed to do. As we are here to pray, we are here to bear with one another and build one another up. And it doesn't stop just because we go out the door. It's something that we're called to. And I pray that we as a church, all of us, myself included as the church, as we're called to it, that we would obey and we would walk accordingly.